Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Nirav Shaw, the director of the Maine CDC. I'm joined this afternoon by Commissioner Jean Lambrew, Commissioner of Maine's Department of Health and Human Services. Commissioner Lambrew and I are pleased to be with you today to talk about where we are with respect to, to COVID-19 for the entire state of Maine for today, Wednesday, June 6, 2021. And we begin today's update on a sad note. The Maine CDC is reporting two additional COVID-related deaths today, including a resident of Androscoggin County, as well as a resident of Somerset County. One of the two individuals who has died was a woman, and the other was a man. One was in their 60s, and the other was in their 70s. Their passings bring to the total number of deaths in Maine associated with COVID to now 827. We'd like to take a moment to offer our condolences to the friends, family members, and communities of both of these individuals, as well as all 827 people who have died in Maine. Right now in the state, there are a total of 67,880 cases of COVID-19, an increase of 61 cases since yesterday. Cumulatively, 2,026 people have been hospitalized. And right now in the state, 87 people are hospitalized with COVID-19. 29 of them are in a critical care unit and 18 are on a ventilator. To put that number in a bit of perspective, 87 is where we stand today. But one week ago, just one week ago, there were 118 people in the hospital with COVID-19. Just in the past week, there are 31 fewer people who are hospitalized and receiving treatment for their COVID-19 disease just over the course of a week, 31 people. I wanted to take a moment to touch upon an outbreak investigation that Maine CDC has opened. This is an epidemiological outbreak investigation into nine cases of COVID-19 associated with A.R. Gould Hospital. Of those nine cases, four of them are among staff members and five of them are among patients. We have been working with the hospital to test all of the potentially affected patients as well as all of the staff who are in and around the medical surgical unit floor where this outbreak seems to be focused. The other epidemiological finding that we've seen preliminarily is that of the four staff members who have tested positive and who are part of this outbreak, all four are unvaccinated. Again, of the nine cases that we've detected in total, four of them are among staff members. All four of those hospital staff members have been unvaccinated to date. Turning now to our testing, our PCR positivity rate now stands at 1.8%. There too, we have seen reductions in our positivity rate over the past two weeks. That number, 1.8%, has been trending downward, and we're hoping that it falls even further. And finally, before I turn things over to Commissioner Lambrew for some announcements, I wanted to talk a bit about the mobile vaccination unit that we have been operating in partnership with our colleagues at FEMA. I'm pleased to announce today that we are changing the route of the mobile vaccination unit. Now, just first for a couple of numbers, to date, the mobile vaccination unit has administered over 9,700 doses of COVID-19 vaccine to Mainers across the state. Right now, the MVU is in Calais and will soon head to Madawaska. From there, we are pleased to announce that the MVU will be going to Portland. It will be in Portland from Thursday, June 10th through Sunday, June 13th. And then from there to Old Orchard Beach from Tuesday, June 15th through Friday, June 18th. It will end its mission in the state of Maine in Old Orchard Beach on that Friday, June 18th. Now these last two sites, Portland and OOB, are different from what we've previously announced. As we've done throughout the pandemic, 
Our goal as part of our response is to maximize the resources that we have. The mobile vaccination unit can administer up to 500 shots a day. And we want to position it in places in the state where it can be doing just that. In short, we are sending the MVU to places in the state where people will be. In Portland, for example, we are working with local businesses and restaurants, as well as service organizations to make the mobile vaccination unit as accessible as possible. We're also going to be working with groups that themselves worked with, for example, those who were experiencing homelessness to make getting a COVID shot as easy as possible. We're also adjusting the hours in Portland to make evening vaccinations more available. We'll have more details in a couple of days. But as a reminder, the mobile vaccination unit will be administering Johnson & Johnson vaccine free of charge. And you will, in the coming days, have an opportunity to make an appointment if you'd like. But if it's easier for you and your schedule just to drop in, you should feel free to do that as well. I'd like to now turn things over to Commissioner Rambrew. Thank you, Director Shaw. I'm happy to announce today that the Maine Department of Health and Human Services is expanding options for COVID-19 rapid testing at Walgreens and other locations throughout the state. This expansion will support people potentially exposed on the job, among others that would benefit from testing. THHS has issued updated guidance about the Abbott Binex Now rapid antigen tests distributed by the state of Maine that encourages individuals who work in hospitality, retail, and other public facing industries to get tested for COVID-19 up to twice a week, even if they don't have symptoms. Previously, rapid testing was recommended only for people experiencing symptoms, close contacts of confirmed cases, and certain critical infrastructure staff through employer-based surveillance testing. With this change, Maine DHHS encourages anyone who works in a setting with elevated risk for COVID-19 transmission who is not fully vaccinated to get tested routinely. This test can also be used by people who are experiencing symptoms of COVID-19. While 64% of Maine residents aged 20 and older have been fully vaccinated, nearly 400,000 remain at risk of serious illness or death from this highly contagious disease. Testing remains critical to keeping our businesses open and our communities healthy as we get about our summer. Testing identifies people infected by the virus early, often before symptoms appear, allowing them to isolate to limit the number of additional people affected. Getting a test when you have a fever, headache, chills, fatigue, or difficulty breathing allows you to determine if you have allergies, a common cold, or if the highly contagious virus has infected you. If you're concerned about your exposure to the virus through the job, we encourage you to visit any Walgreens located in Maine to monitor your health with a series of free rapid tests. There are 60 or more, over 60 of these locations across the state of Maine, and for a list of those sites, you can visit the Keep Maine Healthy Testing site on the governor's website. We also have there a list of two dozen swab and send sites that offer free molecular test, tests um, as well. You also can call 211 for information on how you can get a COVID-19 test in Maine. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Director Shaw, for questions. Great, thanks, Commissioner. Um, before we turn to questions, I wanted to offer a few reflections on where we are right now from an epidemiology and vaccination perspective. Things are, for the first time in months, heading in a favorable, encouraging direction. Rates of new cases are down, and with it, things like positivity rates. And after a period of remaining high, hospitalizations as well are declining. As well, on top of all of those things and related to them, we are reporting fewer deaths each week now. Those are all good signs that the virus is on the run, but not yet out of sight. But what does this mean? Well, it means that if you have been fully vaccinated, large parts of your pre-COVID life can resume, especially if you are around other fully vaccinated folks. 
It means that families can go back to getting together. Grandparents can see their grandkids. Groups of friends can spend time with one another. It means that you can start making travel plans, going out to eat, going to see a movie, a play, or a concert. For many people, being fully vaccinated means that they can press play on a life that has been on pause. The vaccines are the key here. It's safe to say that the vaccines have far outperformed on just about every imaginable metric. They are available at no cost to you. And they are the best way for you to join the hundreds of thousands of Mainers who are now back to living their lives the way they used to. Now you might be saying, I don't need a vaccine, I'm healthy. But I think it's important to remind ourselves of the communities in which we live and remind ourselves that, for example, there are those right now in Maine who can't yet be vaccinated. For example, children under 12. We can make Maine safer for them if we all get vaccinated. Every person who gets vaccinated is a potential chain of transmission that gets cut off. The more vaccinated we all are, the less room the virus has to run. And that's why if you are 12 and over, there is a vaccine in Maine right now waiting for you. The best advice I can offer every single person 12 and over who is looking forward to getting back to the way things used to be and having that summer that we missed out on last year, the best advice that I can offer to you is to go get your free shot as soon as possible. Again, there is a shot in Maine right now waiting for you. So with that, we will turn things over to our colleagues in the media. The first question today goes to Jessica Piper from the BDN. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. Um, I was wondering if either you or Commissioner Lambrew could provide an update on the um, Your Shot to Get Outdoors program, um, how many people ended up participating in that? Sure, I'm happy to do so. So as a reminder, we had this incentive program from May 11th through Memorial Day on Monday that allowed people who got their first shot to get one of six incentives to get outdoors a free fishing license, a free hunting license if eligible, Maine Wildlife Park Pass for a car, for, excuse me, a couple, a Maine State Park pa Day Park Day Pass for uh, before June 15th, an LL Bean gift card for $20, a Sea Dog admission ticket, and Oxford Plains Speedway Pass. During that period of time, 5,365 people got these incentives. Uh, the most popular incentive was the LL Bean gift card, which with about 2,280 people getting that. Next up was the fishing license with 1,344 people getting a fishing license. We did see that 75% of the people who got these incentives were under the age of 50, which was the population we were targeting. We also know that younger people tended to go outdoors. We saw more of them opting for the main wildlife life pass, for example, than older people did. And it's also notable that when we look county by county, we did find that some of those counties where our rates were relatively low, we did see relatively high take up of these incentives, such as Arista County and Kennebec County. We'll be posting all this information on our THHS blog later on today, but we are grateful for all those people who went out and got their shot, got their incentives, and will enjoy, enjoy the great Maine outdoors as a result. Thank you. Um, and then Dr. Shaw, our almost neighbor over in Vermont, um, they were down yesterday to three patients hospitalized with coronavirus in the entire state. I was curious your thoughts on kind of what are they doing right that we're not doing yet? Um, could that be in our future in a couple of weeks? Sure. Well, you know, it, it's great to see that across the country, hospitalization rates have been trending downward. Maine is no exception to that. Uh, and we're hoping, of course, that the current trend that we've started to see with, again, 31 fewer patients just this week as compared to last week being hospitalized, 
We're hoping that's just the beginning of a trend, maybe even one that accelerates. There are a number of factors that drive hospitalization rates, average age, so on and so forth. So it's not so much a question of what one state is doing right versus not doing right. It's a lot of demographics that are at play in these situations. We are generally in the same vaccination ballpark as Vermont. Uh, and so let's hope that as vaccination increases, hospitalizations fall. And with that, things like death as well. Uh, let me turn to Patrick Whittle next. Thank you very much. I, I have a couple of questions. Um, first, uh, just looking at the statewide data, um, it's, it's clear for somewhat obvious reasons that folks who are older than 40 have had a, have a higher higher rate of coverage than, than younger folks. Um, is that gap narrowing though? And how is progress going in, in getting vaccine to folks who are younger than, than 40? Sure. The gap is narrowing, the gap here being those younger than 40 versus those older than 40. Um, just in the last few weeks, two weeks, we've seen an acceleration in, um, say, for example, the youngest age bracket, the 12 to 15 year olds. We've seen them, that group pick up steam, obviously following the authorization for that group. And I've been pleased to see that the pace of vaccination in that group has continued. So we're starting to see, you know, thinking of our website with the various bar graphs, we're starting to see that lower end pick up. Uh, let's hope it achieves parity with the groups 50 and over. That's obviously the goal. And then for all, everyone to start rising, but we are starting to see that younger group catch up. Okay, good to know. Um, and regarding the, the mobile unit, the, the mobile unit is in is in Calus today and it's going to wrap up on June 18th in Old Orchard Beach. Did I hear that correctly? That is correct. Yep, it's in Calus right now. Uh, it's then going to swing over to Madawaska Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. That's June 5th, 6th, and 7th. It will then travel back down south. It'll be in Portland from the 10th through the 13th, inclusive. Take a day to travel down to Old Orchard Beach and be in Old Orchard Beach from the 15th through the 18th for four days, and that's where it'll end its mission. Okay. And one final thing. Um, there's still kind of a, a rural-urban divide in terms of the, the rural counties having a lower percentage of coverage than than, than Cumberland. Um, why is that and, and what is being done to address that? Sure, Patrick. Um, I can start and again, Commissioner Wambrew and I have been working on this and discussing it uh, as well. So there are, the, the why is, uh, there are many reasons for that. Uh, one is initially there, you know, many of the larger scale vaccination sites, for example, were in more urban areas than they were in rural areas. Uh, and so that was one reason, but what we've done to remedy that is to make vaccinations available even from the earliest days with preference to those rural places. So if you zoom all the way back to when the retail pharmacy partnership first started, gosh, I think we're going back to February or March, we deliberately chose locations for our first vaccination partners, which was Walmart back then. We deliberately chose vaccination locations preferentially in rural counties. Later on and more recently, when we had the opportunity to partner and utilize the mobile vaccination unit, for much of the mobile vaccination units drive through Maine, it has focused on rural counties, Oxford, Wyndham, I mean, Oxford County, Somerset County, et cetera. Um, right now, again, in, in, in Callis and then up to Aroostook County. Uh, those are some of the strategies that we've put in place to say nothing of working with doctors and hospitals in those areas to make vaccine available. Uh, Patrick, I don't want to, for a second, uh, uh, discount the disparity between states that are at, or counties that are at the top of the league tables, Cumberland, Lincoln, and Knox, and those that have more catching up to do, Piscataqua, Somerset, and Oxford. I don't want to discount that one second, but just a bit of context around that. If each of Maine's 16 counties were themselves a state, if we were in that thought experiment, even the counties in Maine that are at the bottom of the league tables, Somerset, Piscataquis, Oxford, they would be on par with California in terms of the percentage 
of their populations that are fully vaccinated. I am not discounting that disparity. We've got more catching up to do, but I think that contextual piece is really helpful as well. Uh, Commissioner? Yep, I'll just add two points. So it's not that we're not going to those counties with the FEMA mobile vaccine unit. It's just that they have a throughput as more in the 300 to 500 person a day volume, whereas what we can be doing, and we have opened up this form that says that smaller clinics with a minimum of 10 people can go to these different communities. We're offering such clinics to all those communities that were on the route map to see if they would like to have that opportunity. So we will continue to do vaccination and special efforts in those areas, just a different footprint. And I would note that we've had over 30 organizations apply for those sorts of on-site clinics throughout the state of Maine since we opened up that form about two weeks ago, and we'll be continuing to push that. And I'll also note that we do continue to offer free transportation for anybody who has an appointment and couldn't otherwise get there. As a reminder, that 1-800 is 855-608-5172. So people who do live in remote areas who may otherwise struggle to get to a vaccine clinic can go and get a free ride at that number. Thank you so much. Thanks, Patrick. Uh, over to Megan at WMTW next. Thanks for taking my question. Um, <clears throat> it is also about the MVU. Um, I, I assume this is part of the strategy to bring the vaccine to more people. Um, and I'm curious about the part where uh, working with restaurants and businesses, is this sort of um, an, an incentive program like these restaurants or businesses might be giving gift cards or are you working with them in terms of places to set up? Um, could you just kind of go into a little bit more detail about what that means? Sure, Megan. There are three elements of this. Element number one is for the employees, first and foremost. Uh, we want to make sure that those who are working long hours, particularly in the service industries, restaurants, bars, et cetera, that they've got an easy and convenient place where they can go get vaccinated. So we're looking at working and, and making sure that the those such industries in and around Portland are just aware that the, the mobile vaccination unit will be in their neighborhood and then hoping to work with them to provide time and opportunity for their staff to just get vaccinated. That's element number one. Element number two is what you referenced. Uh, although we, we won't be doing anything deliberate, it may be the case that certain of those establishments wish to offer tie-ins for folks who have just gotten vaccinated, for example. Uh, we're not discouraging that. There are many, many businesses in that area that may wish to do so. Uh, one of our, our, our leads down there has been working with them to again, make sure that they're aware of it. If they opt to offer uh, enticements of that nature, then all the better. And then finally, as you noted, in terms of location, we're, we're, we're right now we're, we're centering on an area that will be somewhat close to Kennedy Park. Uh, we're finalizing all the details and we'll have more information on that. But again, making that mobile vaccination unit accessible for folks, uh, not just in terms of hours, but just in terms of physical proximity. What would be your thought about, uh, I know that Maine has dropped their residency requirement. So are we thinking that this is going to work for tourists and visitors too, and not just Mainers? Is that kind of part of part of the idea? Can, can anyone get a shot? Certainly anyone who happens to be in Maine if they'd like to avail themselves of a shot, then that's all the better. Uh, we're also, uh, Megan, not, not just thinking of Portland, but also Old Orchard Beach now, keeping an eye out for the Mainers who are here seasonally, working in the hospitality sector. We want them, given their frequent interactions with the public, we want them to have the opportunity to be vaccinated as well. Thanks. Um, let me go over to Brian Sullivan next. Thank you, Dr. Shaw. I was wondering if you could discuss a little the breakthrough cases that have been in Maine and uh, any commonalities among uh, the people that have, have been a breakthrough case. Sure, Brian. Um, we, uh, let's start with the numbers. We've had 333 breakthrough cases in Maine thus far. Those are, uh, again, those are cases among, uh, cases of COVID among individuals who have been fully vaccinated. Uh, given the hundreds of thousands of people in Maine who have been fully vaccinated, 
the rate of breakthrough cases right now in Maine is about 0.04%. To put that the other way, 99.96% of people in Maine who have been fully vaccinated have not had a breakthrough case. That being said, we are on the lookout for commonalities among those 333. Here's what we know about them. Uh, there have been the rate of hospitalization among those is, is less than 10%, which is far lower than the rate of hospitalization among those with COVID generally. Sadly, there have been five individuals among those breakthrough cases who have passed away. Uh, as you know, Brian, I don't comment on individual cases. I will say that those five individuals did have other contributing medical factors uh, that were at play there as well, even though they're still very sad that those, that those deaths occurred. We haven't identified any other uh, strong commonality in Maine, nor have we seen any other commonality nationwide. For example, variants do not play an outsized role, do not play an outsized role in the contribution of our 333 cases, although that's something we're on the lookout for. Thank you. And I guess uh, we did a little math here, and it seems to us uh, about maybe 1,000, a little more, got their first dose of vaccine yesterday, or that's what you reported, you know, what, whether that's exactly correct or not. Um, I would be interested to know who that's not a, a child that recently became available, who's getting the vaccine now, and also maybe for Commissioner Lambrew, the next incentive plan to try and get those that have had it available to them, um, have not gotten it and get them on board. Brian, I'll, I'll get back to you on the former. I wanna take a look at the data and see if I can see anything in the age breakdowns of those newer folks. In recent days though, and I, I think your question suggested this, in recent days, a large part of the newly vaccinated have been in the 12 to 15, or for example, Brian, something that I, I know has happened as well, is entire families going in. So the 12 year old, the 16 year old and the parents are all going in as a unit to get vaccinated. That's something I know has happened, but uh, I'll try to take a look at the data and see if I have any more insights. I'll turn it over to the commissioner for the latter piece. Sure. We are pleased with the incentive program, the shot to get outdoors. We are looking at what other options are out there. We have a natural experiment going on across the nation with different types of incentives or rewards, even lotteries that are being offered to people. And so we are taking a good hard look at all that evidence and we'll see what, if anything, we announce yet. We're not ready to do that today, but we are always looking for good ideas to encourage people to get vaccinated. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Brian. Over to Amy Brown next. Thank you, Dr. Shah. Following up on a couple of things that you've said already, uh, and some of these uh, listeners that have asked us about the number of breakthrough cases, has that varied depending on which vaccine people have received? And a listener had asked if there's a place either on a state or federal level, a website they can go to and see a breakdown of breakthrough cases and more information about them, whatever is available. Sure. Uh, no, the breakthrough cases have not varied by the type of vaccine uh, that someone gets. Uh, all three of the vaccines are spectacularly effective. Uh, so we haven't really seen any, any predominance or strong association by vaccine. Um, our website has information on the breakthrough cases, as does the US CDC's website as well. Okay, great. Thank you. And um, a, another listener asked if the CDC might consider posting information about active outbreaks on your website. Um, it's something that we we can consider. Um, you know, a, a, thankfully, one of the one of the benefits of not having as many cases uh, a, a right now is that there are fewer outbreaks, uh, and and so that's one reason we. Even in these briefings, I haven't mentioned as many outbreaks, and one of the main reasons is that there are just fewer of them these days. That's okay, a very great. that's a good thing. Great. And just a one quick last thing: you said that all four of the staff associated with the AR Gould uh, outbreak were unvaccinated. How about the patients? And is it possible that patients contracted it from staff in that situation? We're we're right now 
So uh, assessing the vaccination status of the five patients who we know who have been affected. And uh, Amy, as, as you know, from our conversations over the past year, one of the key questions in an outbreak is the direction of transmission, whether it's a workplace or a healthcare setting. Uh, we are, that's one of the keys of the investigation is to try to understand and elucidate what that direction of transmission was. Was it staff to patient or patient to staff? Generally speaking, it has been staff to patient, but here we don't have a firm handle on that yet. That's again, one of the key questions of the outbreak investigation. Great, thank you. Uh, let me go over to Eric Russell next. Good afternoon, Dr. Shaw, Commissioner Lambrew. Thanks for taking some time. I had two questions. Um, the first question I had had to do with, um, you know, expanding a little bit on the case trend. Do we have a good handle on whether we're capturing all of the virus transmission? By that, I mean, if somebody, we know that younger people are driving case trends, but they're probably only getting tested if they have symptoms or if they came in contact with somebody who tested positive. So is it possible that there's more virus out there that we don't know about, but it's it's in asymptomatic people or do you have any handle on that? Oh, absolutely, Eric. Um, this is a, this is a, um, a common or is a, um, a, 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 a thing in outbreaks, that's the best word I can come up with right now, a thing in outbreaks that, that is, is, well, um, is, is, is well defined and, and studied and different models help you understand or help epidemiologists project and predict what portion of the undiagnosed cases may be out there. Uh, as I like to think about it, it's that proverbial iceberg and in any outbreak, no matter if it's a foodborne outbreak, influenza, tuberculosis, or in this case, COVID, no matter the outbreak, we know that we are only seeing the portion of the iceberg that's above water. The question is how much of the iceberg is underneath the water hidden from view? And there are different assumptions that you can build into models that help you predict what that might be. And you look at things like the positivity rate, testing volume, and you refine the models based on that. Uh, so as we are thinking about COVID from that mathematical perspective, when we run different scenarios and projections and models, we're always running them with different assumptions that assume that for every case we know about, there's one or two or five cases that we don't know about. That's a fixture, that's a better word, fixture in every single outbreak that's ever been investigated. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. The last question I had uh, has already been taken, but I've got another one. Um, so one of the things that keeps coming up among readers and uh, just people in my own life, including myself, um, what do parents, fully vaccinated parents do with kids under 12? You know, there seems to be a lot of like, oh, everything's back to normal. Everything is great if you're fully vaccinated. But there's so many people out there who have children under the age of 12 and parents wanting to provide them a, with a layer of protection. You go out with ma without masks and tell the kids to wear their masks. Do you get together with other people and say, we're going to do what we want because we're fully vaccinated. But, oh, you got to do this other thing. There's a really weird dynamic happening, I think, with families of young children. And I wonder, is that just something we have to live with? <laughs> Yeah, uh, Erica, it's a, it's a great question. Um, I'll offer a couple of reflections and, and invite the commissioner to do the same. Uh, first of all, that, that's, that's really one of the reasons why I, I wanted to urge everyone at the top to, to go get vaccinated. One of the things, and I know, you're, 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 you know your question, Eric, was about parents and close family members, but truly one of the things that everyone in Maine can do to relieve some of that uncertainty that parents are feeling the thing that all of us can do is to just go get vaccinated because the less virus that's circulating, the more epidemiological dead ends there are because we've all been vaccinated, the, that much lower is the risk to kids 12 and under. So that's one thing we can do as a community, as a state, as a society, is just to get vaccinated, which relieves that stress. The, the other observation I'll, I'll make, Eric, is I, I recognize and acknowledge that there is uncertainty here. Um, one person that the commissioner and I work very closely with, this individual has indicated that they wear a mask, even though they are fully vaccinated, to set that example for their kids. Another person that I know very well has indicated that they're not going to wear a mask even when they're around their kids because there's no epidemiological need to. I think where I will end, Eric, is, is a reminder for parents that 
although kids can get COVID, they can get COVID, they can spread COVID. Uh, when they do get COVID, thankfully, their likelihood of experiencing the worst of the symptoms that adults can is that much lower. That's a good thing. And I hope it relieves some of the stress that parents might be feeling right now. And I'll just add, going back to the US CDC recommendations and state of Maine policy, it is still recommended, no matter what's going on around kids, that people who are not fully vaccinated do wear masks in most indoor settings. So that, re that recommendation continues. And out of recognition that most people in pre-K through 12 schools and childcare settings are in that age bracket of either not having access to a vaccine because they're under the age of 12 or in that 12 to 15 year old category where we're very grateful that we're making progress. But just now, because it only was authorized three weeks ago, are we getting the second dose? And basically no youth is fully vaccinated yet. So for those reasons, we require all people indoors in schools and childcare settings to wear a mask, recognizing the majority of people in those settings will not be able to be fully vaccinated. Thank you both. Thanks, Eric. Uh, over to Marissa from WGME. Hi, Dr. Shaw and Commissioner Lambrew. I have a couple of questions. My first one is for the commissioner. Um, you've said businesses can still enforce masking under the governor's executive order. We we're wondering, can individual local government institutions like the state house also still require masks? Well, I will say the main state legislature is a separate branch of government. It has our own rules. So I refer you to the main state legislature for any questions on their policy. And I will note that it's not that our executive order permits businesses to require face coverings, it's there's no federal law or state law that precludes it. In fact, the Equal Opportunities Commission just put out guidance last weekend about what employers can and can't ask about vaccination or ask of vaccination and rules for their own employees. So there is a body of pre-existing federal and state law that does generally allow businesses and others to set terms for their own your know, workers and clients. My other question is for you, Dr. Shaw. Um, and this one has come from a couple of viewers now that in-person church services are happening once again. Some people are wondering, is it safe to sing in church? And do you have any recommendations if not every member of a congregation is fully vaccinated? Yes. Um, so if this, and this is reflected in the latest round of, uh, of guidance that I, I believe is out there. But here, here are some general guidelines around this question. Uh, this has certainly come up and, and folks have reached out to our office. Um, let me start with this. You know, there is, there, there, there is a desire as, as things are inching toward normalcy to go back to those things that have given us joy, pleasure, and solace in the past. We know that singing in houses of worship is, a, is, is top among that list for so many people. At the same time, there are concerns from the epidemiological community about the uniqueness of singing in a space. It's something where you're projecting your voice and thus with it, the aerosol particles that can carry COVID. And you are almost always around others as well because you're in the house of worship singing with your fellow congregants. So. It's a behavior, it's, a, it's an activity that, that, that has a certain degree of risk to it. That risk is a lot lower than it was a year ago when no one was vaccinated, but it's not a zero risk in, in endeavor. That being said, I think there are some things that you can do to lower the risk. If wearing a mask indoors while you're singing is available to you, and that's something that works for you and your congregation, that helps lower the risk. If maintaining a certain degree of distance, six feet, for example, while everyone is singing, if that's something that's available, that definitely helps lower the risk. The two of those in concert with one another lower the risk that much more. Those are some of the guidelines that we've recommended that we've talked about that will help keep the risk low, particularly when you're looking at a mixed population. If, if everyone in the congregation is fully vaccinated, 
that takes you down one path. But if you're looking at a congregation where some folks are vaccinated, while another, uh, while a large fraction are not, that's a higher risk situation. I think everyone's got to be smart right now and do things that actually keep everyone safe. And the other option for some congregations will be to postpone singing altogether until we get to a point where even more folks are vaccinated. That's a conversation that each and every church or house of worship is going to have to have. Uh, let me go to Emily next from the Sun Journal. Hi, good afternoon, both of you. Um, Dr. Shaw, you mentioned earlier about a mobile vaccination unit at Kennedy Park, I believe, and I, I just wanted to uh, go back to that. Um, is that, are you talking about Kennedy Park in Lewiston? And is that the FEMA? Uh, well, I guess it wouldn't be the FEMA. Is that the Promerica? Is this something else? I, I'm just hoping you can give me more details. Sure, so I was referring to the FEMA mobile unit that will be rerouted from uh, will, that will be next routed after it completes its mission in Madawaska down to Portland and then ending its mission in Old Orchard Beach. We are finalizing the location in Portland where that mobile unit will be for the four days uh, where, where it's posted there, but it will be somewhere in and around the Kennedy Park area in Portland. Uh, we've got to have a location with hard floors, with hard concrete or asphalt, so we're looking for a suitable location and making sure we've got uh, a buy-in from all the local officials of what the final site would be uh, in and around that area. And we'll have an announcement on that soon. But that was in Portland, not Lewiston. Okay, all right, thank you. And um, in terms of the Promerica mobile vaccination unit, um, are you, is the DHHS planning to continue that tour? Um, you know, how would you gauge its success thus far? Um, I'm, I'm hoping you can give me a little more detail on, on what's going on there. Yep, we're taking a look at it. Um, and I'll, I'll start, uh, Commissioner, please uh, weigh in. Uh, right now, uh, the focus for the Promerica uh, vaccination team is to now start going back and doing things like second doses. So we're focusing having them go back to the initial sites that they've visited and making sure that they are providing second doses. Where we go with that unit from here, we're taking a look at. Um, you know, it has been providing vaccinations and we're in a position right now where, again, every single person that we vaccinate is a potential chain of transmission that gets cut off. So in that regard, the Promerica unit has been a success, but we also want to see whether there are other places in Maine where we can maximize, uh, if we can find locations of that nature, then that's where we'll go next. If we can't, well, then we're really proud of the work that that unit has done th thus far. And my, my last question, um, for any of these mobile vaccination units or, or small scale clinics or, or just vaccination clinics or, or just vaccinations in general, is, uh, is the state considering any sort of PR campaign, you know, something different right now to get the word out for people who maybe are a little more hesitant or just, you know, haven't really, it hasn't been the top of their to-do list. Are there any ideas or new tactics that the state is considering? Um, I, I can start, Emily, you know, one one note there, we, we have been working on and, and putting out the word around vaccinations to urge folks who are hesitant or who are concerned about potential side effects or who just want to know tactically how to find a place to get vaccinated. Uh, we've put out messages, ads, Facebook posts, things of that nature. Uh, and now the question for us is where we go from here. How do we really talk to people who have a new set of concerns that we haven't uncovered before? Uh, whether that's the same set of ads using, for example, working with doctors in Maine, things of that nature, or a different, a different tactical approach, that's the question right now. And we are going to be moving out now that there is a vaccine authorized for youth on more youth focused advertising, including having pediatricians talk to Maine parents about the safety of the vaccine, trying to have some targeted radio ads to people in their 20s or 20s or 40s to begin to get at the messages that might be convincing to them, as well as just a reminder to think that sometimes 
we do forget that the consequence of getting COVID-19 is very serious if you're unvaccinated. So we may be doing some reminders that this is a pandemic still, the disease is not gone, and the consequences for all of us could be grave should we get the disease and we're not vaccinated. So those are some of the ideas or some of the ac activities that we're launching. Okay, thank you both very much. Yep, thanks, Emily. Over to Chris Costa. Hi, Dr. Shah, Commissioner Lambrew. Um, two questions for you both just regarding vaccinations. Um, and I guess the theme around both of them is, is the word saturation. So <laughs> be prepared, I guess. Um, we've, we've, I, I noticed what you mentioned, obviously, about the mobile, uh, the FEMA mobile vaccination unit. I understand the plan there for uh, why you're bringing it to the locations uh, that you're bringing it to. Uh, are, are you looking at the rates at which each county has vaccinated percentages of its population? Um, is there any consideration by the state about at what point certain counties might reach that threshold of you know, this is this is really all the people we expect to get vaccinated. You're shaking your head already. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I can I can say more, Chris, but no. <laughs> you know, I mean, if, if if there are folks that are still wanting to get vaccinated, we want to provide a free vaccine for them. Okay. Because um, I I know just originally the you know the point of the mobile vaccination unit was to go to those areas that might be farther from a a hospital or a clinic or something like that. And I think that's probably why, you know, some people were um, initially, until you explained it, surprised by the, the two locations that were added, as opposed to maybe some in, a, in one of those counties that may be a little bit farther behind. Well, uh, well Chris, I, I want to just, oh, Commissioner, yeah, I think you and I were about to yeah. say the same thing. Yeah, we're, not, we're not stopping in those areas. Uh, right. Understood. And, and I would say we, we started posting uh, on the vaccine dashboard a zip code map that tries to identify two different metrics or looks at counties and color codes in that way. Number one is the rate, which is what we're just talking about, but also the number of unvaccinated people. So you could have areas where the rate is relatively high, but there's still more than 2000 unvaccinated people because of population density. We know there's pockets of people in different areas. We know by age, as you, as one of the one of the, I think Patrick mentioned earlier, we do have a disparity between older and younger people because frankly, younger people were made eligible more recently. So there's a natural reason why we haven't gotten to them. So we just keep evolving our tactics to try to get to those groups, including youth. Um, we still, again, we're three weeks into eligibility for kids or youth 12 to 15. We're excited. We're about 37% uh, of our 12 to 15 year olds have gotten their first dose, which three weeks in is a pretty good metric. Remember, we always were trying to get to 67% or two thirds of people getting those first doses before we expanded eligibility groups. And seeing that kind of progress in a short period of time is encouraging, but we have to finish that job. We have to get to those pockets of people with relatively low vaccination rates. And then on the horizon is hopefully sooner than later, there will be a vaccine authorized for those kids under 12. So our work is not done. Chris, to underscore that just, just a little bit, you know, I, I know, I think you, you indicated this, but it's not as if in those, um, in, in rural parts of Maine, we are not going to be vaccinating, but given that the mobile unit can do 500 plus per day, if, uh, if, if the folks uh, in, in rural Maine who would like to have a clinic, it may be, it's it, just as easy for us to send a group, say, of public health nurses who can go and administer a vaccine to a smaller number of folks and reserve the large capacity mobile vaccination unit for hundreds rather than dozens. I, I, I think I'm understanding. It's, it's, it's bringing up the areas that are already at the, you know, 60 and 70 percent, getting them closer to 80 and 90 and then dispatching the other uh, resources that we have to those other areas. Is that kind of what I'm what I'm understanding? I think I think that's about right. Yep. Okay. Uh, the second question I had, had had to do with age group, and and Commissioner Lambrew just talked about this. So uh, you know, if if it's too repetitive, you know, please let me know. Um, and Patrick mentioned this as well. We've seen uh, really great progress in the last month in these groups under the age of 50, 49, and younger. I'm pretty sure if I if my calculations based on the the dashboard are correct, in uh, groups 20 to 29, 30 to 39. 40 to 49, I believe we've seen a doubling of uh, percentage of that, those populations with final dose in each of those categories in the last month. Um, 
So I guess my my question is 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 two parts. One, I, I would imagine you feel pleased with that progress. Uh, but the second part is, you know, some of those older age groups, the 50, 59, 60s, 70s, and so on and so forth, are reaching the 60 and 70 percent with a final dose. Um, are we expecting those to still have larger increases or because it seems that their pace has, has flattened off? Well, you know, Chris, I, I took a look at the, the post that you put up and ran it against my own numbers. And I agree with you. I, I think you your, your analysis is correct. We have seen essentially a doubling in the past 30 days from May 1st to June 1st of vaccination rates in people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. I, I am really proud of, of the work that healthcare providers, vaccinators, as well as those themselves in those groups have done. Now, you know, you, you kind of ask the question of what's going on at the back end of that. Well, I, I think what's really important there, Chris, is just to recognize that in those groups, say people in their 60s, 70s, and over, they're already at a really high end. So for example, people in their 70s in Maine, 90% of people in their 70s in Maine have gotten a final dose of vaccine, 90%. Yeah. Uh, in people in their 60s, it's 80%. Uh, people in their 80s, also 80%. So they are already at really, really high levels. I would like to get it as high as possible so we're not unfurling any kind of banner that says anything on it right now, but they're already starting at a very favorable position. I think for the summer, we wanna work with them to figure out, as Commissioner Lambrou has said previously, who's not in that, who's in that 20% or in that 10% that hasn't gotten vaccinated yet? Do they need help? Do we need to go to their door? If so, that's what we'll do. Thank you both. Yep. And the last question for the afternoon goes to Patty White. Thank you, Dr. Shaw and Commissioner Lambrou. Uh, with President Biden announcing a national month of action to get more people vaccinated by the 4th of July, are there any new initiatives that you think show particular promise in Maine? I'll just begin by saying you know, we're, we're evaluating all of the above because that's our job is to see what could work, what might work, what would work. Um, and again, when there's an opportunity to get even one more person vaccinated, that could be one more life saved. So we are excited about the opportunities coming out of Washington. We are looking at them as well as what's going on in different states to see if there are best practices that other states might have adopted, which we could adopt too. So we are excited. We will be doing similar types of activity throughout the month. And we look forward to, um, we already at the, the president's goal of yeah. having 70% of people 18 and over getting their first dose or J&J &J final dose, but we will obviously use this as an opportunity to get as far as we can with vaccinating Maine residents. I don't, uh, I'm not the, I'm not one for any kind of laugh, victory or not, but I think I'd be remiss if, if I didn't note what the commissioner just noted, which is that other states are trying to get where Maine is right now. So we're really pleased, but we've got more work to do. We're going to keep doing it. That's what we are committed to doing, so. Okay, great. Um, and uh, what's the latest count of variants in Maine? And with the new variant discovered in Vietnam, are we gonna increase the amount of genomic sequencing that's happening in the state? Sure, so let me, um, let me actually address the latter first, uh, Patty. Uh, Maine is sequencing uh, relative to other states. Um, so we're, we're sequencing, I'll get the latest number, but as of about a week ago, uh, well over the 5% that the US CDC recommends that state sequence. We were several percentage points above that. And as of, again, as of about a week ago, I think we were the second highest state in the country in terms of the percentage of positives that we sequence. Uh, Wyoming was in the top spot and Maine was just a shade below that, followed uh, somewhat distantly by Hawaii. So we are already sequencing more as a percentage of all positives than every other state save for Wyoming. We'd like to be doing more sequencing. We actually have had discussions recently with one or two national laboratories to sequence a, even a higher percentage of the positives that we get to see what's going on. That's what we do in, in, in this type of epidemiological work. It's what helps us get a sense of what's circulating. But again, I, I wanna start by noting that we come at this being in a very strong position relative to other states. 
The goal for us is how do we get even better? Um, in terms of variants, um, Patty, I'm going to use, uh, if you don't mind, the more recent WHO categorization for the variants, uh, but I'll give you the, the numerical one as well. But for the alpha variant, which used to be called B117, we have found 499. For the beta variant, which used to be called B1351, we found four cases. For the gamma variant, uh, which used to be called P1, uh, we found 60 cases. And for the delta variant, which it used to be called B1617.2, doesn't really roll off the tongue, we have found four cases. Um, we are uh, we are keeping track on these emerging variants, particularly this hybrid that was recently detected in Southeast Asia that combines some elements of other variants circulating in Southeast Asia with elements of the predominant strain that was circulating in India. We have not yet, as of right now, detected any, but as with other variants, A, we're on the lookout for them, and B, sadly, it's a matter of time uh, before they arrive here. Fortunately, based on a paper that was published over the weekend, the existing vaccines that we have in the United States, those three, show strong efficacy against all of the variants that are circulating even it is thought this newest one from Southeast Asia, but there's still more data coming in there. So the answer to the question, I am worried about variants, what should I do? The answer is to go get vaccinated. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Patty. Um, Commissioner Lambrew, that was the last question for the afternoon. So I'll turn things back over to you to close us out. Great, thank you. So while we are excited about the progress that Maine residents have made in getting vaccinated, there are still hundreds of thousands of people out there who are not yet fully vaccinated. That does mean that you are at risk of catching COVID-19 or becoming seriously ill, which is why we're excited to continue to offer free COVID-19 testing across the state of Maine, including the new option we announced today at our Walgreens, which is to get a rapid test every couple of days if you work in that kind of sector where you may be exposed. We want you to, to, to stay safe while vaccination is the way to prevent COVID-19. Getting tested identifies it early, allows you to isolate, protecting yourself and your family. So we urge people who have not yet been fully vaccinated, don't wait. If you have symptoms or think you're at risk, get a COVID-19 test. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. And thanks to all of our colleagues in the media today. And thanks to all of you for taking some time to tune in. We hope everyone has a good day and a good week. We look forward to talking with everyone soon again. Until then, as always, please be kind and take care of one another. Talk to everyone soon.